Hello, everyone. Welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast hockey edition. My name is Kevin Olenek. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E. Subscribe to all podcasts on wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, uh, you can also go to Spreaker.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, to find them as well. Uh, add me as a friend, book, fa- friend on Facebook, Kevin Olenek, Twitter, as I said, K-E-V-O-L-E. Uh, it is the hockey edition. Uh, it is... Uh, usually what happens is the Vancouver Canucks take the front brunt of our stories and the, the Calgary Flames and Edmonton Oilers are usually left in the back for some reason. But this week, it's a little bit different. Sean, how are you feeling about this? The Vancouver Canucks are not the main story this week. I'm okay with it. It's been a very Canucks-heavy uh off season and the, the Flames and Oilers have been a little quiet up until now. Yes, that has changed in a, in a, in a bit of an earth shattering way. And I, I, Heidi, are you happy that we're going to actually talk more Flames at this time? I sure am. Good. We have a couple of guests here. Uh, we do have Matt DeBorg from the Fireside Podcast representing the Flames perspective on the Milan Lucic James Neal trade. How are you doing, Matt? Good. Good. Looking forward to talking some hockey for a change. Yes, it's yeah, it's been a little quiet in in, in Calgary and Edmonton land, and then joining us, uh, taking some time out from his vacationing in Revelstoke from the Oilers YYC podcast. Jack is with us as well. How's it going? Good. How are we all doing this morning? We are great. It is sunny and beautiful out here in beautiful Vancouver. Cannot complain uh, much about that and. Yes, of course, the the trade uh, happened. Milan Lucic signed to the uh, Edmonton Oilers a few years ago on a free agent contract, uh, has been traded to the Calgary Flames for last year's uh, Flames big spending free agent contract, James Neal. Uh, and it's the third time in, in history that the Flames or Oilers have made a trade. I, I was going to jokingly put a poll, poll out that that should actually, I wonder if that should actually be banned, but that's okay. It has happened. Uh, who, who wants to start here? Matt, I'm going to start either Matt or, or Jack. Who wants to pick between the two? I'll, I'll go. Who, who wants to start with the reaction here? Go ahead, Matt. Well, I think the trade is one of those where it, from the Flames' point of view, it's more addition by subtraction. And the, the team, we had a 107-point season, and James Neal contributed virtually nothing to that. So getting anybody that can actually even just play hockey at a basic level is an upgrade on what Neal brought. And you even saw that in the playoffs in the pivotal game five, him getting scratched for Austin Zarnick. And, you know, when you're getting scratched for a player that's a fringe guy at best, you know, you're not doing too well. And so he may bounce back, and I'm expecting him to have a decent season with Edmonton. It's just that, uh, like, his best friend is uh, Mike Smith, and that's part of the reason why he came to Calgary in the first place. So it doesn't really surprise me that he got traded to Edmonton to be with his friend up there. And... I think this is more of a personality issue off the ice because he consistently clashed with the coaching staff throughout the season. Right. Jack, what are your thoughts? Um, It's, you kind of hit a little bit on it. It's one problem child for another problem child. So whether this works out for either team, it'll be yet to see. Um, As an Oilers fan that's been watching the team since the early eighties to watch Milan come in and, you know, he he took a lot of flack because we expected him to be the 30-goal scorer he was in Boston for one season. I'd like to note everyone keeps thinking, calling him a 30-goal season. You know, 30-goal scorer. He's only done it once. Um, the problem with him is his his on-ice performance, his speed, his foot speed, his the, the, the whole intangible of his toughness and stuff, that's been disappearing out of his game consistently since he was in L.A., and then you watch it through the three seasons with the Oilers, it it continued to decline every year. You could see it. You could see him get a little bit slower, not engage like he would in the corners, not engage in the in fights, not engage in being the tough guy on the ice. You could see that all start to to, 
to take a back seat to playing hockey. And unfortunately, he just doesn't have that that speed and that speed with the puck anymore. So even when he gets it in a tight space where you would think he would really succeed being a big, tough, strong man, he loses the puck because he just he gets out bad. Um, I mean, there was a game last year against the Flames. I watched Goudreau out, muscle him in the corner and take the puck away. When you start to see that from a player that that's supposed to be how he plays, you start to have concerns. Now, on the same side, when you watch James Neal, he had a horrible season in Calgary last year. I won't, I won't argue that for a second. The, I think the biggest difference between the two, when you look at their last few years, um, the decline in in uh, Lucic's game, Tim, in my eye, it's from what I've seen in the stats, is much more drastic than Neil. Neil had a bad season last year. I also don't think he was very well used by the coaching staff in Calgary. Um, he's not the type of player that that P- Bill Peters wants on his team to start with. Um, so to see the difference in the two, um, again, it's it's a problem for a problem. Now, it might work out for the Flames. Lucic gets a bit reinvigorated, comes out, throws himself around, texts the smaller players, and they do well. Same with Neil, comes to Edmonton, pots in 15 to 20 goals. That replaces a whole bunch of goal scoring that we missed last year. So at the end of the day, it's a, it's very much a wait to see which way it goes. Am I happy Lucic is not on the Oilers next year? I kind of am, although I think Lucic... If Lucic isn't playing well on the goal front, he is still a very serviceable third-line player. So that's where the risk, in my mind, comes in for the Oilers. Is If Neil's not scoring, there's not a whole lot else he does. Sean, Heidi, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would say that uh, it's, an, yeah, it's an interesting lose-lose lose situation for uh, in, this, in this trade because... Uh, the, the flames don't uh, don't necessarily uh, do anything to help uh, create cap room for themselves. Um, they did a little bit, but not too much. And you're just basically adding a, uh, an anchor of a contract in Lucic to your bottom six. Um, maybe they do need a little more physicality in their game, but uh, I don't. Uh, I don't necessarily think he's going to fit in with the the speedier flames up front that. Uh, Made them was what made them really good in the, in the regular season last year. Um, and as for James Neal, um, if he does uh, if he does recover his uh, his scoring touch and, and all that, that's great. But then the the, the uh, Oilers are, are giving up another asset just to get rid of the the Lucic uh, seven hundred uh, to get rid of Lucic. And I just um, it's I think it, it, it was a, a trade that needed to happen for. The, those two players, but uh, it's just interesting how I think it could end up being a lose lose situation for both teams. Um, so I will say that I was like not very happy when this uh, trade first got announced. Like I, I was very much in the camp of like I wanted Neil to have another year here to kind of maybe just prove that it was just an off year or something just wasn't working out or. or um, but kind of like I've had some time to, to think about it, to process it over like over the weekend, the past couple of days and stuff. And uh, I don't think it's as bad as I was making it out to be like, as you guys have already touched on, it's kind of like a problem player for a problem player. And maybe it just ends up being that they both just need the change of scenery, the change of teammates and coaching style or whatever. Um they could use um as like Sean kind of touched on like it would have been nice if we were going to get rid of Neil we would have like freed up a little bit more cap space in in Calgary but I guess that's uh that's not really going to happen but at least it's it's a little bit to help and um with I guess with um Flames not re-signing uh Garnet Hathaway at least they'll be like some big lug guy to hit people. We need more people for like, Matthew Kachuk's friendship tour. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the one, cause the one criticism that I think happened in Edmonton and I kept hearing was you saw on Twitter how there were pictures and pictures of pictures of Connor McDavid being abused. And my understanding was, was Milan Lucic was supposed to prevent that. And if Milan Lucic is as tough as people said that he was, 
or had the ability to do that. That should not have happened, and yet it did. So I, what I, I I'm not, I'm sure that Milan Lucic, I'm not going to fight Milan Lucic on, in any way, shape, or form. I promise you that. But I, I think the question is, 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 is a guy like Milan Lucic really that much of a deterrent to preventing players like a McDavid, a Gaudreau, or even a guy like Pedersen, Sean? Is that type of player really a deterrent for the quote-unquote abuse that they take? I wouldn't say they are anymore. I think the way um, the NHL has gone with um, how they call the game and how fast the game is, if these if these <laughs> deterrents are out there with your skilled players, you're, 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 you're likely bringing the, the, the caliber of play of your skilled players down. Um, and then if they aren't uh, out there with them, then they're not really doing anything to help deter that uh, – that from happening, and I just think it's 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 something that's gone out of, out of out of the uh, out, of, out of the culture of hockey in in the last few years because we've gone to more skill versus physicality. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Actually, like I don't really see this like whole oh a player's only out there to protect the star. Like I haven't really seen like a. A, like an example of that really working in the past couple yeah, of years. Yeah, e- ever since they got rid of the, like introduced the instigator penalty for fighting back in the 80s, that's basically when that started declining because before if you used to get out of line, the, the goon would just jump that player and beat the crap out of them and now that's frowned upon for some reason. <laughs> Well, there's there's also a massive difference in the way that game of hockey was played from the 80s to now because you put expansion into that equation. The number of very good players in the NHL hasn't really increased, however, the amount of teams have, so that gets spread out more. The 80s, you could put a Dave Smake on a line with Gretzky and Curry, and he wasn't going to be a detriment to your team because when you looked at the rest of the Oilers, it, it, it just balanced itself out. Now, I remember a few years ago in Edmonton, when we had um, Huggy Bear, and his real name's just gone right out of my head. It's too early on a Sunday. And he was supposed to be the protector for the young kids. Like, this is when Hall was showing up. and But he couldn't even barely play fourth line. So you, now you're taking a player that's not contributing at all to your team, whether it's offensively, defensively, on the power kill, or on the pe- power play, or on a penalty kill. You can't do that anymore. The The best year McDavid had without being harassed all the time was the year that he had Patty Maroon on his line because Maroon could still put the puck in the net. He still had the ability to get in the right places. Yes, he was a little slower, but he, he really keyed in to know to, to go to the place where he could get the puck. But if someone did play around with McDavid for some reason and he didn't like it, he was big enough and tough enough. He would go and talk to them. And, and sometimes in a lot of cases in the NHL, I think a lot of times a, a quick skate by with a, a stick in the back going, you do that again and you're not going to see me coming, does a lot more than having a goon on your wing that's going to just try to fight that guy and take the extra two minutes and now you're down for a power play. So I think that culture, I think the biggest thing if we want to take that at the game is the game has to be called by the rule book. And whether we'll ever see that or not, I don't know, because as soon as they do start to call penalties the way they're supposed to call the fans get, they lose their mind because now it's too many power plays. Now it's the game slowing down. Now it's all this other stuff. But until their players get hurt because someone does something that should have been called, that isn't called, people don't really get upset about that. I, was yeah, gonna... I would say that uh, in terms of um, the, the way that the uh, the game is being called these days, it's just it's inconsistent. You don't know what, what you're getting from game to game. And that's why um, when when you do have a star player and they are getting harassed and you do, don't have anyone who can go back, go skate by them and, 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 and give them a talking to, you can, the teams that are playing against them and players playing against with that star player feel like they can get away with it. Um, I think that's why the, the, the Vancouver Canucks have gone out and, and traded for JT Miller and uh, signed uh, Michael Furland is that they're, they're adding some size and grit to their top six so that, uh, they don't have to. They have someone who can play with them, with the, with the, the Pedersen, the Besser, and the Horvats, 
and not and but not have to but are going to bring the the line down too much because they're not going to be <laughs> eight <laughs> two zones behind when uh, they're skating up the ice. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, it, 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 I'll get back to what I ex- what, what the expectation from Neil, but but Jack mentioned that James Neal was not used well by P- Bill Peters. Matt already stated that it was pretty clear that there was something on the page of Bill Peters and James Neal. They were clearly not on the same page. Actually, it's kind of also fair to say that I would say it's also even fair that Bill Peters and Mike Smith were not on the same page. Uh, how was how do we? How, what did we think of how Neil was used specifically in Calgary? Was he used to his best of abilities, or uh, was this just not a fit in some way, shape, or form? And how did the Oilers use him better? Other than obviously throwing him to Connor McDavid. Uh, I well, think uh, from the point of view I look at, like you got Bill Peters down in Calgary. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a very quick comparison here with with the conversation with Bill Peters and then transfer it to James Neal. Peters was in Carolina last year, and that team sucked. They fire Peters, he comes to Calgary. Carolina played very good hockey this year and got into the playoffs and made a good push. It was a, a the, the, the change in that team from one year to the next, primarily a coaching staff change, was amazing. He came into Calgary with a good group of guys. But when you look at what he did in Carolina, he started to do the same thing in Calgary, where it's a bit, and I don't want to say old school hockey because it wasn't, but it's a very defensive minded scope. So when you bring a player like a James Neal into a team like that, if you're the GM and you hire that, you give that to a coach that expects all this defensive zone priorities before anything else. James Neal is a scoring winger, always has been since the day he stepped on the ice, probably as a, a, you know, an Adam player back in the early eighties. He's not a, he's not a defensive player. He goes out and he scores you goals. He scores enough goals and gets enough assists that his plus minuses are still in the teens and the twenties, but you can't put him on a third line. You can't put him on a pop power, like a penalty kill, which they didn't, but he never seemed to get the chance to meld with the top line. And, whether that just wasn't going to happen or not, it's just he got bounced around, he got moved around, he got put in, in my mind, he got put in positions that James Neal is not that player. And if your coaching staff isn't putting players in positions where they can succeed, they're not going to succeed because players, it's, it's finding that coaching staff has to find what players fit what positions. They can't always get a player to change what he's done. You know, Neal's been playing in the NHL since 08. He's been there for 10 years and this is what he does. If they're not going to put him in the position where it allows him to succeed, he's probably not going to. That doesn't mean Neil couldn't do more maybe to have adjusted his game, but you play a game a certain way for 10 years and get asked to do something completely different, it's going to take time to make that adjustment. Well, back uh, at the beginning of the previous training camp, uh, they did briefly try both Neil and Lindholm as the first line right wing, and Neil was actually supposed to be the guy. It's just that it was readily apparent that Lindholm had that special chemistry with the two guys. And when you see that, you're going, well, yeah, you're going to throw that guy there just because it seemed to be a better fit. And then figure out Neil, like they tried him on the second line with Kachuk and Backlund, and that didn't work at all. And then it's like, okay, now what do we do with him? Because... (coughs) Uh, Lindholm was just clearly better on the first line, and like they didn't. I don't think the Flames had the expectation that James Neal was going to be on the third line or the second line when they signed him. I think they expected him to play on the first line with Gaudreau and Monahan, and Lindholm was not really expected to be. I think that he was expected to be the second line guy with uh, Kachuk and Backlund. And, you know, because you look at his previous history, he's a 40-ish point guy. You're not expecting him to just magically turn into a point-per-game caliber player. And it was one of those where, like, both Neil struggled a bit and his job got taken by surprise. And it sometimes that does happen. It's just that it was a bad situation for both Neil and the team where 
there was no easy way to maneuver him into a, a different role because I think they were expecting him to be the first line winger. Yeah, so basically it was uh it was Lindholm's fault for being too good, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and taking Darn. that yeah, taking that top spot and then not being able to then what do you do with Neil cuz like you're not going to break that that top line up when it was playing so well just because Neil needed to play there. And and you said like they did try him on the second line and he wasn't melding on that second line either. So yeah, it's just yeah, it was just kind of a tough situation. But like I don't know how you would have even have have fixed that. So and that's one of the reasons why I think this trade isn't bad from Calgary's point of view because now you've got a player in Lucic that you can throw on the third line and he'll play like a third liner where Neil, he really needs to be either on the first or second line, and that's otherwise he's not very useful. Sean, go ahead. Oh, I, I think that, that those are good points. It's just uh, in, in the salary cap era, you're, you're, you're paying Lucic that much money to play on your third or fourth line is, is quite... Some is something that you don't really want, and as a Canucks fan, you got you. We have Louis Erickson, who was part of this whole trifecta of circle of doom that was apparently <laughs> uh, almost became a three way trade. And um, but it's just if you if you if you have a uh, five five plus million dollar player uh, playing on your third or fourth line. You really need to be able to find some some extra um, cap space elsewhere with uh, some cheap players out outperforming their their contracts up in the top line and then as well as uh, in the uh, on, on your blue line. So and with Riddich no longer being on an, an entry level uh, contract, you're going to have to. Uh, really, really hope that you've got some 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 of your, those young blue liners coming up and and uh, outperforming their their contracts uh, for the Flames and then for the Oilers I really think that if he can if Neil can can find some chemistry with either McDavid, Dreisaitl or Eugene Hopkins however uh, Tippett uh, um, to, uh, puts together the lines uh, I think that'll go a long way to helping him uh, recapture the uh, the 20 goal scoring uh, uh play that he had uh, before he uh, joined the Flames. Yeah, it's, I mean, I guess for me, the one thing that I think if, if at best, if Lucic gets 10 or 15 goals and does like third line, fourth line, heavy line, heavy minutes, and is pretty effective with either a Derek Ryan or if he's still around, which is a fair question, a Mark Jankowski, I think, okay, that's, that's good. I, I do have a small suspicion and a bit of a bold prediction that I, I am half or about 20% uh, with this prediction that I, I wonder if we're going to see Lucic in the minors because I don't know if he can keep up with this team. I just don't know in terms of his speed, uh, in terms of even you look at the forwards on the flames, there's a guy like Dylan Dubé that needs some time. Um, I don't know if Lucic actually can crack the top 12 consistently. I think he's, I think he's a 12th and 13th forward, but if they get third line, fourth line minutes from him, I think that that ends up and he does his, he he does 10, 10 goals. I think that that's heavy, but I think Neil, if you find a space for him, whether that is McDavid or whether that is Nugent Hopkins. And realistically, you can look at a McDavid dry cycle, Nugent Hopkins, James Neal combination. I don't, I don't know if that works or not. I think that that, and he gets even 15. I don't see how 15 hurts the Oilers that much because it was, it's nine more than they got from Lucic and you got a guy really that you can kind of move. I still think in the right situation, you probably can play him on a third line. I, I do see why people are saying he's a top six forward. Um, I I wonder how much that was playing with a guy like Mark Jankowski 
um, and sort of his style just didn't really blend with Neil where another third line center could be a fit if and I, I guess that would depend on what you're doing with dry Jack uh, in Edmonton are you putting are you keeping him with McDavid or do you put him in the middle I guess that's going to be one of the questions going into the season right oh yeah for sure and that'll all play out with how the other centers we have on the on the team after the few little tweaks we were able to do because we're up against the cap. Like if, uh, if uh, Granlund can come in and, and pick up that third line center position while maybe Korea goes back to center or, uh, you know, even Gagne, if they don't put him on the wing and throw him back to center. And there's also Colby Cave that we always keep forgetting about in Edmonton who had a very good uh, end of the season. Um, you know, not like he's going to go out and score you 20 goals or anything, but he was a very good, you know, um, fourth line center that could that gives us the flexibility at the top where you've got McDavid potentially dry sidle as your second Nugent Hopkins as your third line center but if you need to you can put dry sidle up but that'll all kind of that'll kind of play out depending on what the right winger situation turns into this year because we're still waiting on a few things to to work their way out and we resigned Chase on which is great he can definitely play well shouldn't say definitely. Last year, he showed the ability to play on the first or second line fairly consistently. At the end of the season last year, Cassian had an amazing run up on that, that top line, um, playing to that potential that we probably talked about from Cassian 10 years ago. Um, so that could be interesting. And then it'll all kind of depends what plays out with Puliarvi. If that works its way out that he does want to come back and sign a one-year contract and try to prove his worth – there's still some stuff that's kind of up in the in, in the air there. So in my opinion, and, and it's not the most popular opinion in Euler fandom, I have no problem if Dreisaitl ends up as the right, right right winger to McDavid for the next 10 years. That doesn't bother me at all. His contract doesn't bother me. I have no problem with a guy making $8.2 or $8 million a year scoring 100-plus points sitting on McDavid's right wing. I don't care. That doesn't bother me. This whole he has to drive his own line. To me, is nonsense. It's hockey. It's a team thing. If the team needs him there and he pots 100 points in, go for it. And then if there's injuries, at least you have a, a serviceable or a, a usable player that can move around a little bit as well. You know, so there's an injury and you got to put him back at center on the second line. He doesn't hurt you in any way, shape, or form when you do that. So it's it'll be just that 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 center, those four, four starting centers with the Oilers. There's a few things in play yet that are going to determine that. And if the worst outcome is you have McDavid number one and Newton Hopkins number two, that's a pretty good one-two lineup, or center lineup in the NHL these days. Hmm. Do you ever regret, there was always uh, this thought, Jack, and now that Tyson Berry was traded to Toronto and Vancouver is expecting, some Canuck fans are expecting him here in the next year. Uh, do you re- uh, regret not getting that Newton Hopkins Tyson Berry, Ruber, deal done, or do you think at the end it turned out all right? No, I'm okay with it not. Nugent Hopkins has turned in, like, <laughs> Nugent Hopkins is a very underrated player in the NHL now. He has turned into a, an exceptional two-way center um, that most teams would highly covet, uh, just covet because of his ability to go up, get points on the board, but also keep points out of his net. Mm-hmm. Um He's not, you know, maybe he's not a, like a Datsuk type level player, but he has those that makeup where he's playing a two hundred foot game all the time. Tyson Berry, yeah, he's he's a fairly decent, um, he's a fairly decent defenseman. <laughs> I don't think he's an all around defenseman. You would have, we if we had made that trade, I think we probably would have suffered in the long run with him. And that, that's not because I don't think Tyson Berry is not worth having. It's just, I don't think he's, I don't think he's quite where you need him to be, to be that number one defenseman that you're, you can leave in the number one and not have to worry about it. Um, he's getting better. Obviously, as he gets a little bit older, he's really starting to, you know, be more responsible. You're not seeing like the minus 34 point plus minuses anymore. But that's also playing on a Colorado team that's really starting to shine. So am I glad we kept Nuge? I am, because I don't I don't know. If, at the time, though, that trade was rumored to happen. I don't think that would have been in the best interest of the Oilers, because I think that would have been hanging 
Tyson Berry out to hot, out to dry on the back end of the Oilers at the time. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what do we expect for Lucic? Like I, I kind of made my predictions. Matt, Sean, Heidi, what do you, what are you expecting for Lucic? Where would you fit him in your lineup? I'd actually try him briefly in training camp with Kachuk and Backlund just to see if there's any chemistry there that you could get more out of. Uh, but more likely you're going to see him on the third line with Bennett and Ryan. And I think that what you're going to expect from him is just to be a physically engaging player and a defensively minded guy. And he you know, to his credit, he was one of the better defensive forwards in the advanced stats for the Edmonton Oilers. So it's one of those situations where, like, I, there's nobody that expects Lucic to put up 20 goals or 40 points. Like, if he does that, awesome. But, yeah, you also have to be realistic with how it is. And if he plays 82 games and chips in, in other ways, then that's the important thing. Yeah, I'm completely agree with that. Like, I think, I, I think it would be cool to just try him on that second line for sure with with back with Backlund and Kachuk. Like, and plus it would just be fun just to see yeah. him on a line just kicking the, the shit out of people. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. And but if he fits into that like kind of more like third line role with with Bennett and stuff, and maybe that'll be good, and maybe. Like, I don't know, Fl- Flames fan talks to this about to death, but, like, maybe it'll be the spark that Sam Bennett needs to eventually get back to where he was, so. I, I don't know what, Bennett had one, had that spark in the playoffs, and I do, I and mean, he played really well. He was one of the better Flames forwards in the disaster of the first round, but he was one of the few bright, shining moments. I think Sam Bennett is, I think Sam Bennett will be one of the, uh, a Claude Lemieux-ish type of player, Esatikinen type of player, where I think his playoff numbers will probably outshine his regular season numbers. I think he's he's in that vein. Yeah, I think that uh, you're gonna the Flames will try Lucic out on that second line uh, in training camp and in preseason, and even a few times throughout the the beginning of the season, just because you're gonna try it, you're gonna want to try and see if you can get something out of that uh, um, bad contract and and maybe make him make him uh, a try something 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 someone that uh, Seattle and Ron Francis will want uh, um, when the when the expansion draft comes around but uh, I think you're gonna most likely see him on that third line as you guys were saying um, maybe even the fourth line just because uh, that's fits his game these days. Uh, one uh, variable with him that I'm curious to see is that Edmonton for the last couple of years has been not so good. And I'm wondering if just him playing on a playoff team might inspire him a little more. But I, I don't know. I think that uh, he, I think he's got uh if you don't have the, the speed and the, the legs, inspiration's not going to change anything. Yeah, I don't think it's as Jack has said. I think it's a lot of a lot of what's been ailing him is the fact that the the games pass him by in terms of speed. Uh, he, he can't really keep up with the, the game anymore. So it's you got to figure out uh, how to how to utilize his his size and, and uh, physicality when he can get in there because. Like I said the, the the games pass him by speed wise, so even when he can, you, you can even on the four check, he's not able to get get in and and get to the defenseman before they move the puck quick uh, away from him quickly. So uh, it's just uh, it's more of that versus uh, motivation, I think. Well, two years ago when the Oilers did make the playoffs in sixteen seventeen, he had twenty three goals, twenty seven assists, and fifty points. So. I mean, there. I can see the opportunity for motivation. I guess it's the it's the it's the, what the ability is. I think is what and how he how he handles that. I think going going forward. I think is is where that gets that's interesting to me as well. Um, I guess going forward here, two. I guess two other kind of looking forward with the Flames and the others going forward. Uh, 
Matt and Heidi, there was the talk of Nazem Kadri. He did niche the deal uh, coming to the Flames. It was reportedly the reported deal was Kadri and Brown for Jen Kelsey and Brody. Are you upset that this didn't happen? Yes. Yeah, I would have actually not minded that deal either. Uh, we, the Flames have too many defensemen, so getting a top six forward for Brody, that would have been perfectly awesome. And I think that the Flames are trying still to find another similar-ish guy. Uh, like, I think that now that they got Lucic, they don't need to worry as much about getting a physical guy. But I could see them, like, looking at Winnipeg and uh, trying maybe Nick, e- Nick Ehlers or... Uh, with Montreal with a couple of their different players. So we'll see. I think that the Flames are going to eventually trade Brody for a forward. It's just the who and what team is yet to be determined. Yeah, I'm so surprised to actually still see Brody on this team. Like, I thought he would be be gone already, so... Uh, I'm one for the, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I don't see it with Kadri. I know that there's some sort of, I, I know that we've watched him every week on Saturdays at four hockey night in Canada and he seems to have some love, but I, and maybe it's just my perception, but I've seen him be more of a deterrent to what Toronto was than a benefit. And I'm not seeing how Kadri could be a benefit to the Flames. Um, I just, I, I, it's just my view. I think he's a bit too undisciplined. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I think that he was a little bit, I think we've overrated him a little bit because he was on Hockey Night in Canada on on our TV a lot. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the perception of Kadri is in Colorado. I'm not as convinced that he's a solution that people have made him out to be. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Well, it's not like. Uh... Like, I like Kadri a lot. It's just that getting any top six forward, really, for TJ Brody, I think is a good deal for the Flames, regardless. It's just, you know, anytime you can get a top six forward for a defenseman that's a year away from UFA, I think is a good deal. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And the other thing we have to remember is that he's not going in there to be a like a super game changer. He's just a, going into Colorado to add depth and give them a, and give them a, a better second line behind the McKinnon line. Right. So uh, if he, if he just continues on with his 40 point, 50 point uh, for career, like he, that's more than, that's more than good enough for the, for the Colorado avalanche. Fair. Fair. Uh, Jack, what do you see for the Oilers going forward? What's, what's next? What needs to be done? Not much, unfortunately. Um, Holland's been handcuffed pretty heavily with what was there left behind, the mess that was left behind. So we kind of figured there wouldn't be a whole lot that would happen in free agency just because you couldn't physically do it. And I don't – I mean, we've we've seen in the last six or seven years that big free agent signing, you know, pan out all that well in the long run. So I think what you're going to see is just some minor tooling. Um, you know, there's talk about um, – Brodziak going LTIR because he's done, um, making those small adjustments. And then standing pat, more or less, for the year. Um, I think there's still a chance we might end up with Patty Maroon. I think that's still, you know, hanging out there. Um, once he kind of makes the decision, I, I think the offer might already be there. It's just him making up that his mind whether that's what he wants to do or not. Um and that'll be about it because there's not much else we can do unless somebody proposes some mammoth trade. I know there's a lot of Edmonton fans for some reason want to get Nurse traded for something, which doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, you know, if there's someone come along and for some reason wanted Russell and gave us something back that was serviceable for a year, I don't think anyone would complain about that. But as for major changes, I don't think you'll see anything until next off season when we have you know, the cap room opens up that we can we can actually make proper trades potentially for players as opposed for, you know, prospects or wings and prayers. Fair. And you mentioned that before, so, too, as well. Um, well, we've covered enough of that. There's another – the other big story that happened in Calgary this week is there is a tentative deal 
tenant, repeat tentative deal for a new arena in Calgary. Uh, it is projected to be cost between five hundred and fifty million dollars to six hundred million dollars. It's based on it's a uh, 18,000 seat arena with retail space, a community rink, and a 40,000 square feet of underground parking. The expectation is it's going to be at or where near where the Saddle Dome is. Uh, City Council, Calgary City Council, will be voting on this behind closed doors, 3:45 Calgary time. So we should see a result of that tomorrow night or Monday night, depending on when you're listening to this. I want to start with Jack, cause, and then we'll go kind of around here, because I'm, I'm intrigued um, about the fact that this, because you went through this as an Oiler fan with the new, with the Oiler Arena. Uh, what are you, what are your thoughts about how the discussion has come here in Calgary? Although it has been silent for a year, uh, but it was part of the mayor, mayoral campaign. And what are you expecting to come out tomorrow? I honestly have no idea what I'm expecting to come out tomorrow. Um, there hasn't been much said in the last couple of months so that there's suddenly there's a tentative deal. It's been done very, very quietly, which either goes one of two ways is the ownership group stepped up, found a way to help fund it more and made city council. Oh, this is great. However, I think it's the other way around. I think this is going to come out and not look good upon the city of Calgary when it gets announced. Um, a few months ago, there was a, a vote done to use a massive, infrastructure rainy day fund in Calgary to fund three huge projects, one being the arena, one being the new convention center. And now if anyone can remind me what the third one was, that would be amazing. But it was another third massive project. And there was a lot of concern out of some of the council, some of the city, some of the business leaders going, we're the city is hurting big time right now. And it's going to continue to hurt for a while. This kind of infrastructure build, I don't think it's the best time. I mean, I know that people like try to say, oh, things are tough. It's the best time to do infrastructure. That's when you do roads and bridges. That's not when you build arenas and convention centers. Um, you can do roads and stuff, get a deal on it. That infrastructure lasts you for 50 years. If the city's taking the biggest chunk of this arena deal, that's not good for the city right now. I'm not saying don't build a new arena, but you need to find a way to do it so that it's not – it's not going to be detrimental to the city over the long term. And that's my fear right now for Calgary is they're, they're searching almost daily for millions of dollars to cut into the operating budget of the city because of how bad it is. They've increased taxes to businesses outside the business core by, you know, up some of them up to a hundred percent increase over a year. You're now they're talking about the, one of the most major infrastructure projects Calgary's taken on in, forever with the LRT green line, they're, they're talking about stopping it, even though all of the funding for that is in place from all three levels of government. So they're, they're doing a whole bunch of knee jerk reactions because of what's happened in the city. And now they're going to announce an arena that's going to get built. So I'm very curious to see how this plays out because we haven't heard anything. There hasn't been any real rumblings uh, as to what's going on other than location. They want to keep it close to the saddle dome. You know, I suspect they'll tear the saddle dome down when it's done. But if it's if it's a detrimental deal in any kind of in any way, shape to the city, the backlash in the city right now is going to be it's going to be horrendous because people just aren't there's no appetite for it. Calgary is a very different market than what I'm used to growing up in Edmonton, where the Oilers are kind of it's the thing. It's not in Calgary. It's nice to have, but anyone who lives in Calgary knows the say nobody in Calgary is from Calgary. So you don't have that same grassroots support that you do in other cities that have NHL teams, and especially like the Edmontons of the world or Winnipeg's or even like Columbus, those kind of teams in the States. So this, if this deal isn't, doesn't look beneficial to the city, it's going to be, it's not going to be well received. Calgary's downtown does not need the revitalization like Edmonton's did. The, the revitalization that Calgary's downtown needs is they just need industry to come back. They don't need an arena to pull an industry. That's not going to pull your industry downtown. Edmonton used in Edmonton. In Edmonton, they used the arena and the ice district to revitalize a section of downtown that had been basically an empty parking lot for 60 years. So it's a little bit different way of an approach. So 
this is it's going to be very interesting. I'm very interesting to see what the deal is here because it's been far too hush hush than I thought it would be. And Calgary's been doing a lot of that hush hush stuff for the last couple of years, and it doesn't seem to play out well in the long run. Are you referring to Calgary next, or was it something else? No, you were talking about the third project might have been that green line. No, thing. the green line's been it was approved years ago. So it was that that was project. that was approved like three years ago because that received billions of dollars in funding from the province and the and the federal government. Um, I can't remember. There was three big projects, and it was the it was the Greeno was part of it, and then there was the new convention center at the BMO, and there was a third project. And for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it's going to be. But it was, but it was basically using six hundred million dollars that they don't really have to fund it. Hmm. The thing is, one thing is that has come out is that the, the the flames as the organization are going to be putting in a lot more money than Dale Cates did to to get the Edmonton Arena. So, I like I said, I'm still skeptical on it. I'm expecting a huge backlash because I'm expecting. Um, the uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of public money going into into this uh, into this arena, and that's just doesn't that doesn't sit well with with Calgarians these days. If you look at you look back at uh, last November when we had the uh, Olympic uh, plebiscite, and everyone didn't want that because of all the because because of all the public money that would have gone into that, and it's just. I just don't see. Yeah, I just don't see it going over too well. And as you said, Jack, it, Calgary's become a lot more of a, a town, a town and city that where people have moved to, as opposed to grew up in, where they don't have the the, the emotional investment in the in the the Calgary Flames and and all that. So uh, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how how nuclear it gets in, in Calgary in terms of. Uh, how went on Monday when it gets uh, announced what the actual uh, funding details are. Yeah, and it doesn't help either that uh, last week was announced that Calgary is like cutting all kinds of services. I don't remember what the number is on it, but sixty it's million. Tra- yeah, it's transit, it's fire, fire services, and everything yeah. under the sun that they can find money. Yeah, like that's coming. These things were like announced like a almost a day apart and like, yes, I understand. I know that there's like a difference between like an operating budget and a capital projects budget, but a lot of people aren't going to see that. And it is like, as Sean said, like it's going to cause like a lot of rage around here. So yeah, like I really hope that flames ownership is planning on stepping up if they're going to, if they're going to get this arena built. so It'll be interesting to see. Like I, I think that, like of course, the main reason for it, uh, the arena is getting more concerts, really. But um, it, it'll be interesting to see exactly what the numbers break down as. And, <clears throat> like, if the it breaks down a little bit more towards um, the Flames contributing more that, than the Calgary Next situation. I think that'll be more well-received, but, uh, yeah, it, it's not going to be too, too too pleasant. I, I would be, frankly, shocked if it wasn't, like, a massive outrage from most people, even though, you know, like... It, being one of the few people from Calgary, um, it, it it's nice to see like an an actual project like this, where like now we can actually get big name concerts instead of having to go to Edmonton or out, other cities just because we didn't have a proper venue. And I think that'll be encouraging. Um, but we'll have to wait and see exactly what the details are. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm expecting a big backlash, no matter what, uh, because I, there was a huge backlash or when it, about this before. I'm expecting this again, especially 
and it doesn't matter like how you explain it. Heidi's right. When you're cutting from essential services and you're putting in what some people are calling rightly or wrongly a million something for rich millionaires, which is, is, is how some people want to spin it. There is a perception around that, that that's just doesn't work. Uh, so I'm curious what the, what the flames ownership is contributing. But I also hope that there is some reason to this because there is like one of the things that I think does get lost here and is what the flames do in the community. The end, not only just with the flames foundation, which is no different than the Oilers foundation or Canucks for kids or, or any other NHL team, everybody has that, but like the players within the community, the, the, the stuff that they've done, I, I, you know, and what they do contribute overall to the city, I think is massive. And I think that, like, in the midst of this debate of millionaires getting getting rich or whatever, I think how the Flames contribute to the fabric in the city of Calgary, I think, is an important part of this conversation. And that arena is not only going to be used by the Flames. It is going to be that the intention is to bring in concerts, uh, things like that. And I do th- I do think that, that it's fair to expect the taxpayer to pay at least a little bit. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know how much is ultimately going to be fair. That's a negotiation maybe in a different way. But I, I, I think there has to be some sort of expectation here that the public is going to have to pay something. Like, it, it, I, I, I would hope that there's not an expectation that the Flames ownership is going to completely have to fund this. Although I can see some people making that argument. I, I don't know if that's a reasonable expectation, though. I think you have to be careful when you look at a, a building like that and say, oh, it's going to bring in concerts. Okay, so it brings in 10 more concerts a year. Did that pay for it on a public tax basis for a $60, $600 million building? Um, no, it, it just doesn't. It's one building. You're only going to collect a certain amount of tax source from it. It'll also come down to the conversation of how the money gets split out of the arena. Who yeah. gets the money that, from what people pay for to use at the arena? Um, I know people... There was the comment made there, Kate's got off, you know, didn't have to put in enough because of the city of Edmonton. But the plan in the city of Edmonton, which is drastically different than what Calgary will do, is, yeah, the city put in more money than they probably should have for the arena, and I'm not going to argue that. I wish Kate's could have put more in or should have put more in. However, the plan for the development of that part of downtown based with an anchor of the arena, it's happened, and it's happening. There's... I don't know how many towers are being built or have been built already around that site. The tax base that was never there before is is shot up exponentially for the amount of money that, that the city is now pulling in from revenues due to a new arena. A new arena in the same location that the current one is in Calgary is not going to drive that much. There's already been plans for those towers that were supposed to get built in Victoria Park before the bust in 2008 or whatever it was. So, it's not going to have the same effect on your downtown or on your city as the arena in Edmonton, for example. But one of the, and we've talked about this on the podcast when it comes to concerts. Uh, We have some people that are involved in the radio industry for a long time that are involved with us. Edmonton is seen in North America, especially in Canada as a concert city and Calgary never has been. And it had nothing to do with the buildings. It's that when the big concerts go to Edmonton, they can sell out one or two of them. And it doesn't have to be like a Garth Brooks or somebody. It can be like a good rock. I remember when the Eagles had a run in Commonwealth, or not Commonwealth, in uh, the Coliseum years ago. They did a three-night show, and they couldn't sell out the one in Calgary. So Live Nation, who runs everything almost, some of those concerts literally skip Calgary. has nothing to do with the Saddle Dome. They have, they have secondary setups for smaller arenas. They skip with Calgary because they don't get the ticket sales. So relying on the, the fact that they're going to bring all these concerts in, that, that to me doesn't justify the cost of the building over top of the, the hockey games. And to what Heidi said, this is a building that not everybody will ever get to use. Whether you're going to a Flames game or get the opportunity to do a skate with your kids team there or whatever it is, it's not a public amenity. It's not a library. It's not a, it's not a public arena. It's, it's a privately run arena that the city is helping to pay for. So your access to it is very much limited to what the private organization, being the Flames, will let you use it for. And to, to Kevin's comment, I agree wholeheartedly with what 
sports, any sport team, as a general rule, does in their communities that they exist in for their charity work and their their they're sh- like showing up at events, like just players that go because they want to go. That's a huge part of sport, and it's it's a very important part of the conversation that I know people completely forget about when these conversations start. Is there they do give back fair, quite heavily to the community, just maybe not in the way that people think they should. But that's that's anything. I mean, you can argue this for anything in the world. There'll be people for and against. I think the biggest problem is in the current climate that Calgary is fighting in, to drop public money in is not going to be received well. Even even a little bit? Like, even if, like, like this is a negotiation here where, like, okay, like, it has to be, like, we're not, the Flames go, it's 80, I'm spitballing numbers here, 80-20. You still think that the like that is still not going to go over with the public? No, because what's 20% of $60 million? Hmm. And what's the amount of money that Calgary's had to cut out of the essential services and had to raise the taxes for all the small businesses in Calgary to offset their loss of taxes downtown? I'm not saying it's the same thing. And, and Heidi brought it up. There's a much different way that services, like city services, are done a completely different budget to infrastructure, which they've always been. It's just the way the money gets divvied up. And that's great. But Again, we're back into a city that was just about to start a multi-billion dollar expansion to their public transit system, and now all of a sudden everybody's up in arms about it, but it was all approved two years ago, and now they're literally talking about voting to stop it. Like, the money's in place. It's all there. It's good to go. There's no there's no reason not to do it, but now they want to stop it. So you take that $200 million, well, now we can build two or three bridges that are missing, replace a bridge that's falling apart downtown. The infrastructure that Calgary's built up over the years with the amount of bridges they've done is draining their their infrastructure budgets every year just to, for basic maintenance to keep them up and operational. But now you're going to take $200 million that could be used in infrastructure and build an arena. I'm not disagreeing that a new arena wouldn't be great for downtown Calgary. But we're at a time in Calgary that the way they're struggling, this may not be the way to do this. And I would... I don't know. I'd have a hard time believing the, the Calgary ownership is going to put eighty percent of the funding in. Based I, I was, on who, who I, I, I'm the, spitballing a number. I, I don't. I'm not. Yeah. I don't think it's fit eighty percent at all. But I, I'm spitballing that there's there's there has to be an appetite for the public. There's got to be a number. I'm thinking that this the the public is like, okay, look, well, it's it's not great, but there is benefits to it. I do see benefits of of sport and what can be done in that with an arena there that can continue to build the city infrastructurally, morally, uh, or uh, morally, not morally, morally, I bet it's probably a better word and, and use a number of different things that, you know, can revitalize the city that I think that, that, that I, 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 sorry, but I, I, I understand the argument that from the public, like not having the appetite, but I do think that the public has to expect to pay something. Like I know that this is ideal. I, I, I think I think the problem is the way you're wording that. You you expect the pay. The public should expect to pay something. I think right now the public doesn't want to talk about this. Like I think that's where the the divide is right now. It isn't that oh yeah I guess we're gonna have to pay something. It's the public right now with what's happening in Calgary going. This is we don't even want to talk about this right now. This is we got way bigger fish to fry. Why is this coming out now? We got there's way more problems in city council and in and, and, and Calgary than building a new arena. I think that's where the divide is right now. Like the question of the public saying, Yeah, we might have to put some money in. Uh oh, yeah, yeah, great. But we don't but from what the city's had to do with taxes and everything else, there is no money. So how are we doing this? Why are we doing this? What's the and point of this? Jack, I, uh, I found that uh, what the that the, the one point five billion dollar capital projects uh, um, funding it was the is Arts for... Common and uh, right, yes. I... What was the other one? It was the Arts Common? Am I right? Arts, I, was that arts, one? Yeah. New Arena, Arts Common, um, the expansion to the BMO Center, and then a new multi sport field house. Oh yeah, the field house. That was the that other was it. Yeah, it was because that was the field house was part of Calgary Next, right? Yeah, Calgary um, Next was supposed to be this like gigantic area that had an arena. 
uh, a field house. They were going to move the stamps and, and um, out of McMahon and, and build a, uh, a field there and stadium there for them to play. Yeah, it was huge. <laughs> Well, they, that hasn't been talked about, and that's a subject for another time. The, the Stampeders absolutely 100% need a new stadium, like, with, without a doubt. Well, you don't, you don't like walking under stands that I'm pretty sure a farmer built in the field in, like, 1934? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, I... I, I mean, I, I don't know if I'll ever go to a game at McMahon Stadium again. Like, it's literally, like, I'm not trying to be a snob, but I, Swan Guard Stadium may actually be better than McMahon at this point in time, which they're talking about here to use possibly for BC Lying End. Whole other, whole other subject. Uh, Heidi, Matt, and Sean, what do, you, what do you think? Like, what are you thinking about the public dollar perspective? Are you kind of a jack on this, or...? It's I, I'm torn because I I see the, the the I think there's a lot of a lot of the arguments that make make sense uh, fiscally and where Calgary is economically that it doesn't um, building a new arena right now probably isn't the right way to go and it's not really going to benefit uh, and have much more of an economic benefit than what we currently have from the Flames. But then, then again, it's like you have to look at uh, how it, the potential of them leaving, folding, or whatever, uh, and, and losing that, right? And I don't think that's a legit threat at this point. I think that's that's still five, ten years away if that's ever a, if they don't build an arena. But you also do want to be able to 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 have a place where you can. Ch- People come in and they, they're they're excited to come in and watch a game at at the the, arena, the Calgary Arena, and I don't think you get that with the Calgary Saddle Dome at this point. Yeah. And um, yeah, like just, uh, I've been under the stands and that, uh, and like in the dressing rooms and that, and yeah, it's the facility is quite lacking throughout the building. It, it it's actually kind of bad that. By and large, the concourse is actually better than the underbelly of the dome. Well, that got that took a hit during the flood, right? That was yeah, one, yeah. And they've done stuff to rectify it, but it wasn't a lot. Like it wasn't no, yeah. It's not that much better than it was, or worse than it was. It, apparently, it's been always kind of lousy down there like the, literally the only nice thing down there at all is the dressing rooms and that's literally it so so, so matt what do you, well, i guess what do you think is it fair to expect some public funding here or yeah it, it, it it's one of those things that like calgary is trying to emerge as like one of the the main cities in canada and you see, like, everybody refer to, like, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver as being, like, the, the notable three cities in Cal- Canada. And I think Calgary's trying to push into that. And you need to have your a sports team. It, it sounds stupid, but it's true. And there needs to be some public funding. I, I don't see it being, like, a 50-50 split or anything like that. I think that... Like, even the Calgary Next thing, uh, it was two-thirds, uh, like, it, only a third was truly city money. Like, the there was a loan for the ticket tax for a third of it, and <clears throat> I think that you'll see something along those lines. I don't see, like, if the bill ends up being, like, $600 million, I don't see it being more than 150. Uh, being supplied directly from the city, um, we'll see. Though like, it depends, like everything, it depends. Like if the, the city is putting in way more money than that, then they're more outraged. If the users of it, like through a ticket tax and the flames side, end up paying for most of it, then it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, no, I, like, I agree that, like, 
the, the taxpayers like should put at least some money in it. Like, and forget when you are naming out all those things that would be part of the deal. The word community rank is in there, and Calgary needs yeah, more space definitely. Like, in to because that has been a huge concern in Calgary is that there's not enough ice to hold all the hockey teams and the rec teams and the learn to play programs and all that stuff. I know like I wanted to join one of those learn to play programs. And the only time that it was that you could do it was at 11 o'clock at night during the week. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So if it's going to help in like, at least that kind of sense. And yeah, for sure. Like the public money, at least a little bit, but it's just, it's just Bad timing with just all the the cuts and the the whole shenanigans with the whole green line and the review of the tunnel because I think that's what the problem is now with the green line is how they're going to deal with uh, downtown and how they're going to do that. So it's just it's just such bad timing and for it to like not be talked about and then just come out of nowhere is just it's very strange. Well, I think it had to be silent. I I, I think. I think that they needed to have the silence because the public outrage and what this was, uh, was not good. And, you know, I think in part, that is why we're seeing Brian Burke on Sportsnet, quite frankly, is because what he said, I don't think sat well with a lot of people in the Calgary public, whether you agree or disagree with that. And I think the way that Ken King came out of this uh, oh, Ken King needs to keep his mouth shut. He absolutely oh. should not be talking in this. He there's not there should be not one single word from Ken King going forward on this because he he did not help the situation at all. But the and the the Flames PR took a hit out of how they handled it. So I absolutely needed to be silent at this point for it to be an actual negotiation. Um, but. I understand how that op- the optics are looking that one day you're making these cuts to essential services and the next day you're giving a rink. I think that that's going to be that that's the question going forward and I it would be interesting of course Heidi being the social media rock star here. I think it's going to be interesting what happens on social media when the influencers on influence on one side uh I'm not you know, the Mike Morrison's on one side and the Eric Francis on the other and how that's all being going to be perceived as, as well. I think that that will be interesting. I the, the other, I guess the benefit out of this is there's not a mayor race going on. So this isn't the Nietzsche versus Bill Smith campaign. We could legitimately look at this and say, look at this as a deal, but I don't know if I had a specific question in there, but maybe what, what are you expecting social media wise, Heidi? Uh, it will, it'll be very ragey. It was already starting, uh, on, on Thursday or whatever day it was that, that, that cut start came out. And then with the, them saying that they're going to talk about the arena deal, like it was already starting, um, from what I follow. So yeah, depending on, I don't remember you said, I think you said what time that they're doing the three, three forty five. 3.45. Okay, good. So Monday night, it will be, it'll be very, uh... We'll step very away from, yeah, step away from the computer, and, you know, otherwise you'll just be hearing nothing but yelling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, it's... Yeah, it's gonna, it's, I'm expecting it to be full-on Oh yeah. full-on chaos, because that, and, yeah, and then, like, I know I'll personally hear about it, because people will say, Oh, you're a Flames fan, so you must support the arena deal, no matter which way it's going to go, and all this stuff. Because I've heard that before, so yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see. I'll just kind of sit back and probably not say too much of anything. I like to observe. So, the one thing from a Vancouver perspective that I do think is interesting, and you know, is when the World Cup was announced last year that it was coming to Canada and the states, and Vancouver was not part of that list of. T- Places we were playing that games were going to be played in Edmonton. There was a lot of people really upset with because ha- they saw that as a huge benefit for the city. So you know, I mean, I it's I do think like I do see a loss of this magnitude I, from a Vancouver perspective, and there's economic challenges here. Uh, for the love of God, there's economic challenges here. 
of a ton of here, but you know, I, I do think that I hope that the, the power of what sport can do to a community. I think I hope that there's an educational component of that because I mean, there's a there were a lot of people on both sides of the fence when Vancouver wasn't part of that. There were some people who were like, oh, "Great, because we, we don't want to deal with FIFA because they're a corrupt organization." But the other side of that is this is a really huge benefit to having World Cup soccer come to Vancouver in a pretty diverse market and a loss of huge money and actual people attending BC plays. So that I think will be, that's, it, it's interesting that part of it, but yeah, I don't know. Is there, I don't know if there's anything much more I, I we can add to that. Maybe we'll leave it there. Um, all right. Uh, let's leave it there. Um, Jack, I understand that you are recording tomorrow and you have a guest on your show. Yeah, some crazy lady from Calgary, some Flames fan, she's going to join us on the Oilers YYC podcast tomorrow night. Her name's Heidi. I think that sounds right. So we're, we'll be lucky enough to have Heidi down at the Big and Duke with us to, to talk more about the the meal trade. And uh, by then, we'll do, there'll be the announcement about the arena. So we'll have, uh, we should have lots to talk about tomorrow night to, uh, down at the Pick and Duke with a few beers and see how things uh, play out as the day goes on in Calgary. Yes. Yes, that rumor is true. I will be there. Oh, you're the Heidi. Oh, yes, that would be me. Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Matt, what are you guys? What are you guys doing on the Fireside podcast? Are you guys doing anything? Uh, I'm not uh, too sure. I think that uh, we'll probably just wait a little longer because I I think that there will be more shoes to drop, especially around the arbitration, which is coming up fairly soon. So I think that we'll just probably leave it until. Uh, then and like do have like four or five things to parse through instead of just the one or two and yeah it's just a matter of waiting basically and seeing it'll be interesting to see exactly how things shake out with those arbitrations yes. uh, for Riddick and Bennett yeah uh, and, and is Majapani up too uh, no uh, he's just an RFA All so right. Yeah, he's not eligible yet. So the uh, next contract, he will be. And Sean, what are what do you, do you have anything going on? Or I'll just be uh, I'll just be <laughs> trying to uh, avoid the the negativity of uh, <laughs> that will be tomorrow tomorrow after the announcement of the funding. Right. Uh, we I'm scheduled myself to talk to Kyla Lee is going to come on to talk about uh, drunk driving laws here in British Columbia. So I'll be doing a non-political or a non-hockey related podcast here uh, and we'll be kind of keeping up with things. We'll probably have to talk about the arena deal in some way, shape or form. Yes, I do think it's not a Lee Calgary story. I do think it's a national story as well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we are looking and building. Heidi, uh, uh, Heidi will be hosting this, an all-female hockey panel. We are working on guests now. Uh, we don't know when this will happen, but we're planning to do that. And we've got a bunch of other things going on. Uh, but where do we follow everybody? Uh, am, you can, sorry, sorry, Sean, you can go first. <laughs> I am Beardy Connect 3 on Twitter. Uh, I am uh, Heidi Maysballs or Heidi Maysballs on uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, Reddit, anywhere you can find me. So H E I D Maysballs. You can find us at uh, FiresideChat.ca and uh, at Fireside Podcast on Twitter. Jack? And you can find us typically at Oilers YYC um, on all social media platforms. And then me personally, you can find me at Big Man Try on Twitter. And yeah, that's where we hang out most of the time. Right. You can follow me on Twitter at KVULE. And also, I keep forgetting to mention my website, KevinOlytic.com. But this was great. Thanks, guys, for taking your Sunday mornings to join. Uh, now we can all go out and enjoy the sun. And we will talk to everyone soon. Bye for now.